evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome to the National Building Museum. My name is Scott Kratz. I'm the Vice President of Education here at the museum. It's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, to our historic home. For those who m might not know who we are, the Building Museum advances the quality of the built environment by educating about its impact on their lives, on people's lives. We do this through innovative exhibitions, uh, programs and collaborations such as this evening, youth and family programs. Um, and what's key to the museum's mission, absolutely critical, is the profession of planning um, the, as we explore all aspects of the built environment. We feature leading planners in uh, many of our lectures, our panel discussions, and uh, advising us as we move forward with thinking about our public programs and exhibitions that we present here at the museum. And we are proud tonight to present the, this evening's program with the American Planning Association. Uh, to introduce tonight's speakers, uh, I'm delighted to present Paul Farmer, uh, a good friend of the museum's, a longtime advocate for planning. Paul is the chief executive officer of the American Planning Association and the American Institute of Certified Planners. He has primary responsibility for the long-term strategic direction of the association in concert with elected leadership. He is responsible for re representing the leadership of the association, its members, and the interests in planning and partners with the public. Uh, the, um, the museum is proud of our partnership and our alliance with the American Planning Association. It has collaborated with us in many ways, uh, first as a Corinthian member of the museum and as a supporter of our exhibitions and programs, including serving as a presenting partner of our long fought lecture on city planning and design. Paul, on behalf of the museum, thank you and APA for your critical support over the years and look forward to our continuing partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Farmer. Thank you very much, Scott. And uh, I certainly never tire of walking into this building. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonder. Uh, it's great that it was preserved and is used in uh, such an active way. And if uh, you haven't had a chance to come here for programming, uh, I would encourage you to do so whenever you're in D.C. Uh, they have an incredibly active program. Uh, you can find out about it online. A terrific kids program that you often see uh, in operation at the other end of the Great Hall. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the bookstore that... Uh, sort of is unparalleled for the kinds of things that those of us in the design and development professions uh, gravitate toward. Uh, tonight we're going to have uh, another in our series of lectures, the Daniel Burnham Forum on Big Ideas. And this will be a panel discussion after Bill Anderson, our president, uh, makes some opening remarks. It's fitting because two years ago we started the Daniel Burnham series in uh, Chicago with a panel discussion. Uh, Mitch Silver, who's here tonight, our immediate past president was on that panel along with the presidents of ASLA uh, and AIA. Uh, and so tonight uh, we're going to have uh, about 15 minutes or so of presentation by Bill, followed by remarks from our other panelists uh, of several minutes each. Uh, there will be a, a bit of a panel discussion here, uh, and then we'll conclude the program with some Q&A with the audience, and there'll be a roving mic for that. And we ask that you uh, hold up your hand and uh, speak into the mic because the program is being recorded. Uh, and also, uh, I've indicated to the panelists that they're welcome to say anything they want about themselves. I'm going to give, your, give you their name, rank, and serial number. That's about it. Uh, but uh, the Daniel Burnham Forum is something that we've had around the country uh, in order to explore the issues of uh, the trends we see in the country, the emerging issues, uh, and what some of the big ideas might be uh, as uh, we uh, uh, help guide our communities uh, in addressing uh, those issues. Uh, it's been a very popular, very successful forum, uh, and we continue it here tonight. Uh, and in order uh, of their seating on the stage, uh, we will have uh, Bill Anderson, who is the uh, president of, of APA, uh, begin the remarks. Uh, his day job is uh, as a principal and vice president with uh, AECOM out of the West Coast. Uh, he'll be followed by Nancy Somerville, who is the chief, chief executive officer of the American Society of Landscape Architects uh, and another great partner of APA's. Uh, uh, as is the Building Museum. Uh, and then following Nancy, we will have Lee Brown, the president of APA's Professional Institute, the American Institute of Certified Planners. Following Lee will be Patrick Phillips. Uh, Patrick is uh, CEO of the Urban Land Institute, a uh, former colleague, I believe, of, of Bill's, uh, when they both were working for uh, ERA uh, and doing economic planning work. Uh, and batting cleanup tonight will be uh, DC's very own uh, Deputy Mayor uh, of D.C., Victor Hoskins, who has a portfolio of responsibilities dealing with planning, economic development, and uh, uh, related matters. Bill. This is the 
is a terrific building, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if you noticed that um, on the freeze uh, outside the building, it depicts the uh, public coming to a council hearing to hear a, uh, a presentation by the planning director to increase density in their community. <laughs> foresight. So anyway, the, the theme of today's uh, talk is about planning for economic prosperity. It's really to touch on a, uh, a theme that uh, uh, we've talked about internally that uh, sometimes in some circles planning is seen as a discipline that's trying to prevent bad things from happening instead of a discipline to make good things happen. And so we have a strong tradition with economic development and it's time we, we remind ourselves of that, but also remind some of our colleagues and partners who are involved in city building uh, and economic development uh, of our role in history. So, what do these have in common? In the 2000s, Arlington, Virginia, and the Pearl District in Portland. In the 1990s, Vancouver, British Columbia, and Lodo in Denver. And by the way, when I was in British Columbia in, in Vancouver on vacation, there was a brochure there about um, planning and planning for the city's economy and how important it was to the city of Vancouver. And it wasn't in the planning department, it wasn't in the city hall, it, it was in my hotel room. And so they're very proud of the role of their plan and the quality of life it creates. And in fact, it's become an export industry for Vancouver. They call it Vancouverism. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, they're involved in uh, city planning in Asia and the Middle East. In the 80s, the revisiting of, uh, and rediscovery of Miami Beach and the uh, reemergence uh, and reinvention of Pittsburgh after the steel industry uh, took a hit and realizing that, uh, as Neil Pierce once said, Pittsburgh is a city and one of the most beautiful natural locations for a city in America, and recreating that vibrancy. In the 1970s, Oregon's urban growth boundary, the uh, Senate Bill 100, they just celebrated their 100th anniversary in Oregon of that landmark legislation, that preserved agricultural lands, prime, prime agricultural lands and resources from urban sprawl, but in the process created a market that led to the regeneration of Portland, for which it's famous today. Or Quincy Market in the 1970s, Boston using its historic resources to reinvent the city, which went through a period of, I believe, 30 or 40 years without a high rise between the Depression and I think the 1960s in one of our oldest cities in America. In the 1960s, Research Triangle in North Carolina, reinventing the South with technology in North Carolina, positioning Raleigh-Durham, and then in Irvine, UC Irvine, anchoring Orange County to become a new vibrant center of commerce in California. Uh, Jerry Brown Sr. used to joke that he, uh, the reason uh, he discovered when he won the governorship, there were two counties where he lost, Orange County and San Diego County. So they were the first counties to uh, where he decided to set up new universities, UCSD and UC Irvine, because he felt they would benefit from the education. <laughs> And then the 1950s, of course, the interstate highway system, which we heard about today, has pluses and minuses. But one of the things it did do is bring commerce and trade to remote areas of the country and integrated them into our national economy and to the national economy, the global economy. And in my own San Diego, Mission Bay, where after World War II and the Korean War, rediscovering they needed to diversify the economic base and leveraging its natural assets to promote tourism and develop a tourism industry for which it's famous today. But of course, we've been doing this for a long time. The Burnham Plan for Chicago, sponsored by the Commerce Club of Chicago, the business community of Chicago, not to just make Chicago a prettier place, 
but recognizing that the role of planning and urban design was important in positioning Chicago as the new American city of the 20th century. And it's not just, what's the one thing they all have in common? It was planning for economic development. It's a long tradition. This is not something we're entering into new, newly after the Great Recession to promote why we're important. This is something we've been doing for over a century. And in fact, before that. And it's not just the large cities, it's the suburbs and small towns too. From Boulder, or, uh, or in Minnesota, in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, Rockland, uh, Maine, or in my own uh, San Pasqual Valley, where leveraging agriculture with recreation. But the economy is global, we know that. Trade is global. We as cities and regions and towns and planners really don't have much influence on exchange rates, cost of capital, global trade patterns, cost of labor in Asia or Mexico or other parts of the world or what they're doing to position themselves to compete against us. But what do we have that we can influence as planners in cities and regions? The capacity for our targeted industries to compete in the world economy, infrastructure quality and effectiveness, education, our institutions, whether they're universities, medical, cultural, the cost of living, particularly the cost of housing and workforce housing, then influencing the livable wages, which then influences the cost of business to compete on the world stage. Place in history. It's very difficult to offshore place in history. It's associated with the location. I was like, joked in North Carolina last week, Las Vegas has tried with uh, New York and Venice and uh, Paris. And then the quality of life and environment, which is more important now than any time probably in world history because of technology and how it links places. And then market image. And you notice on this list of attributes and factors that influence a cities and regions position in the world economy, we as planners influence these factors day in and day out. We're integral to the process. So what is your economic vision and roles? The region within the world, the city within the region, and then a community or place within the city. And knowing our base sectors, our portions of our economy where we export goods and services to the rest of the world, bringing dollars into our regional economy that then gets redistributed to business to business sales or to household incomes. The one third of the economy that really is the foundation for the other two thirds of the economy. Know what they are, what are their linkages? Whether it's in my region with telecommunications and biotech leading to telemed industries or biomed industries using algae with agriculture and biotech or leveraging tourism to bring people to a region to discover its other attributes for economic development. What's the potential for their convergence? Once we understand those things, then, as planners, we plan for capacity, the land and the space for those targeted industries to thrive and to grow, goods movement, infrastructure, bandwidth, and housing. Housing is part of the economic development infrastructure, and our general plan should reflect that. This map here depicts in uh, San Diego, when we updated our general plan, the last remaining political issue was uh, prime industrial lands. We had a prime industrial land policy because home builders and, uh, and big box retailers were buying lower cost industrial land and then proposing to convert them to residential and retail uses. And we were worried we were going to lose the capacity for our base sector industries in biotech, telecom, defense, and uh, other technology companies. And so we set up a higher threshold of policy to preserve those prime industrial lands so those businesses and industries could grow, operate 24 hours a day, and not worry about the conflicts that might come from other land uses. However, on the other half of our industrial lands that were already encroached by these other land uses, we actually encouraged workforce housing to be closer to the jobs. Plan to respond to the market. 
which is always changing, the flexibility to adapt. Uh, I remember um, once going to an HP plant in Roseville near Sacramento, and they said they didn't know what their product was going to be three years from now. They're constantly changing. They had a million square foot facility that started out as a manufacturing facility, then a uh, service facility and call center, and then back to R&D. That kind of churn is something they need, and so we have to have plans that are flexible to accommodate that kind of churn in the modern economy. And that statue up in the uh, right corner is Ernie Hahn, uh, who passed away a few years ago. San Diego went through the uh, phase of losing three of the top ten SNLs during the SNL crisis. We lost our financial center. We were a national financial center with savings and loans. We were trying to think what should we do with our downtown, and Ernie Hahn led a committee and came to the conclusion that we were too close to Los Angeles, even though we're bigger than Seattle and Denver, to be a financial center for that part of the country. So instead, to devote our resources to our regional employment uses and for uh, to be convert downtown to a tourism downtown and a residential downtown. And in 20 years, we now have 30,000 people living in downtown, planned for 90,000 people. The investment in residential amenities helps tourism and vice versa. Look at our plans, not just as plans to fulfill public objectives or also visions, but also plans to reduce risk and transaction costs for investors and development, including the environmental review that goes through each of the stages in the nesting of the environmental review. The if a developer has to go through the same kind of process to implement an adopted general plan policy as he does or she does to amend a plan, why should they care about a plan? The incentive here is to reduce those transaction costs for those types of developments we want to see in our communities. Plan for efficiencies and effectiveness, looking at joint use of the different facilities. This is a uh, illustration of the planned uh, tra Trans Bay Center in San Francisco, which is a multimodal center that's also uh, the designated area for high-speed rail. And you notice that the rooftop is going to be a green park, an urban park. And the land uses around it, which will be enhanced by this park, have increased entitlement density. But in order to exercise that, they have to, as a condition, participate in a special tax district to pay for the park and maintain the park. So it's using infrastructure efficient, efficiently for meeting multiple purposes and looking at the return of investment. And when we plan, we're planning for market choices. And we know that through housing diversity, community diversity. And it's not just that people have different choices. There's a reason I, there's what, Baskin Robbins 38 flavors or whatever it is for Baskin Robbins. It's also ourselves, through our different stages in life, have different choices and needs. What we need for housing in our 20s may be different in our 40s when we have children, and in our 60s when we're retired and empty nesters. So we as planners create those choices, and by doing so, we create a market. We have an influence on that market. And that also applies to transportation and mobility choices. Uh, one of the things we often hear is, well, why should we invest in transit if only 10% or 20% of the population, or more often 6%, take transit? Well, there's a reason for that. That marginal difference between a congested freeway and one that's running smoothly is that marginal impact of demand is coming onto the freeway. If we create choices, then people have options and can find their own equilibrium. That's why the grid system works instead of a engineered system where everyone goes from their home to the same arterial to the same freeway. Works beautifully under the engineered formula, but if you change that formula, increase density, then it doesn't work as well. When we have grids in six or seven or eight different ways to get to work, that creates a market for transportation. Plan to build and capture value for infrastructure and amenities, urban design and architecture, entitlements, and it becomes the foundation for development agreements, the use of incentive zoning or bonus zoning. It's the basis for the Vancouver plan, and you have great, uh, a great example here in Arlington. In San Diego example, the FAR bonuses have led to payment for infrastructure and eco-roof and affordable housing in our first mixed income downtown project. And then plan to retain and attract talent. And this is probably something that, of course, we've heard about 
uh, and Richard Florida's research and thesis. And where housing and culture, education, the environment is more important, it's part of the economic development infrastructure. Because nowadays, with technology, people have choices. They can live in Charlotte, they can live in Boise, they can live in Raleigh, they can live in San Diego. And positioning our cities to attract and retain that talent is part of the economic development strategy, and we're an important part of that process. And it's not just the big cities, it's also the smaller cities. For example, there's a slide here of Truckee, where a company, a national real estate service company, is located and grown there from two people to 80 people. And they were able to do that because of technology. And why do they locate in Truckee? Because of the quality of life. Why are they able to compete nationally? Because their employers are happy and they're productive. Plan for fiscal health. When we look at our plans, what does it mean in terms of our fiscal ability to support the plan? In Raleigh, for example, Mitch's uh, city, they looked at the fiscal impacts of alternative forms as they were looking at alternatives for their general plan. Chula Vista has a citywide fiscal impact model when evaluates projects on the discretionary level. San Diego, we have impact fees where the impact fee for urban infill is one-fifth of the impact fee for greenfield development. That variable impact fee system provides an economic incentive to develop uh, infill instead of sprawl. But it's important to consider our affordable, our plan standards. Are they affordable? If we look at our general plans and were to build them all out, could we really afford to operate and maintain them? That's an analysis that should occur, and certainly our customers expect that. Plan for shared opportunity and prosperity, the social equity aspects of planning. Uh, in economic development, you often see people who are focused on the base sector economy and people who are focused in community economic development and often they're not talking to each other, yet they're linked. And it, even when we look at our transportation system, this is an issue we're having in San Diego, where we have the transportation system, the transit system, that links the, the lower wage, uh, lesser educated neighborhoods to lower wage, lower paying jobs, where tourism is concentrated. And they're demanding that in the next wave of infrastructure investment, transit links them to a higher paying, manufacturing jobs and tech sector jobs that are in the northern part of the city. That's something we need to think about. And then plan for innovation. With this churn, with that product five years now from now being different, the iPhone came on in, what, seven years ago? Not that long ago. It's planning for innovation. And whether it's biotech in, uh, in Winston-Salem or in San Francisco where they're repositioning old port lands to be incubators for high-tech companies and startups, or in San Diego where some developers and property owners are proposing an idea district, which uh, ULI had a uh, conference there regarding the idea of measuring, maybe the metrics is not rent per square foot or sales per square foot, but how many ideas do you generate per square foot? And then plan for sustainability and resiliency. Uh, you've heard in the conference about the Sustaining Places Initiative and, and the role of the comprehensive plan in the Sustaining Places Report. San Francisco PUC is developing a triple bottom line model that incorporates not only the financial metrics, but also the environmental metrics and values it, and the social equity metrics and assigns a value to that, and uses that model to analyze individual projects products and projects to decide what is the best course for their investment, including looking at some of their infrastructure, such as stormwater systems, and turning them into amenities for the city and creating value in multiple ways. An example of that as well is Cleveland, and Robert, the planning director of Cleveland, made an interesting presentation about the role of the contracting city. After 60 years of trying to be the Cleveland of old, of the 1950s, they finally came to the realization that's probably not going to happen. And he said, once they came to that determination, it opened up a whole new set of possibilities and ideas for rethinking Cleveland in the future. And the reuse of some of the abandoned properties for open space farming, and not just commercial, or not just neighborhood agriculture, 
but commercial agriculture that supports a farm-to-table movement within the city of Cleveland to reposition it in terms of quality of life. And then finally, as we learned long ago, plan for inspiration. We as planners and designers want to inspire. The public wants to inspire and be inspired. And that is that inspiration isn't just for our quality of life, it's also for our economy and economic development. And when we plan well, we plan and attract investment which creates jobs, and we should measure that. And finally, the Great Places program is an opportunity to illustrate that with the public. Those are places we're celebrating today. More often than not, they've benefited the properties around them. There's been economic benefits from those places. But also, those places were built. Before that, they were engineered. Before that, they were designed. Before that, they were financed. Before that, they were planned. And before that, it was just a group of people's idea behind a, in a on the kitchen table or uh, somewhere in a uh, room somewhere. Planning is an important part of that process, and we have an opportunity to communicate that when we celebrate our great places. And the only significance of this picture is it's my hometown, and I like it. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite uh, Nancy Somerville, the CEO of American Society of Landscape Architects, to make some remarks as well. Nancy? That was fantastic, and I will touch on a few of the things that you said, and they all rang true, but a couple of them in particular um, resonated with what I'm going to talk about, and most particularly that with our new technology, uh, it's more and more critical that our cities, our communities of all size, um, be environmentally lovely and wonderful places to live because people can and do vote with their feet. Um, so. Uh, quickly, some of the drivers of economic vitality in communities of all sizes, and as Bill pointed out, it is all sizes and all scales of intervention that make this happen. Water, um, it is to either have too much of it or we seem to have too little of it. Uh, back in the spring, areas of Chicago flooded, um, by the way, not in the flood prone zones. It flooded because of the way that we have built um, the way we have taken away our natural systems and put down impervious surface, which was great when we were starting to develop, not so great now at the point that we are, uh, where we have over impervious ourselves. I know that really isn't a verb, but uh, what you see on the left, um, the darker color is the heavy impervious zones. On the right, the darker color is the heavier number of uh, flood claims and the little blue squigglies on the right, which you can't see very well, but what the, that slide, what the picture on the right is telling you is that most of the claims are not coming from the flood areas, not coming from the flood plains. They're coming from the areas that have the greatest amount of impervious surface. And Chicago is not alone in that. Um, it's everywhere. Um, and of course, we have cities of all sizes, not just the large ones, but certainly the large municipalities are struggling with it. Cities of all sizes that whether they have combined sewer systems or just your regular run-of-the-mill um, and the four regular sewer, separated sewer systems, they are all overwhelmed and stormwater runoff is of course the number one cause of pollution in any urban watershed. Um, at 10% of impervious surface water quality starts to degrade, when it gets to 20% it becomes poor. Um, D.C., our lovely D.C. region, all of it has 46 percent, and that includes all of the suburbs, all of the parkland, and D.C. is blessed with a huge amount of parkland. When you get into New York City, it's over 90 percent. So is there any wonder that our watersheds are challenged, and is there any wonder that we need to find a different way of building that's not going to be impervious, that's going to look at restoring natural hydrology? Um, that's why cities like Philadelphia are moving into green infrastructure, because the old gray infrastructure isn't going to handle it. By the way, it's cheaper to go green. Uh, New York found that one out too. DC is also at the forefront of moving into green infrastructure. Not only is it cheaper, but the green comes with a myriad of benefits. Uh, you don't get a more vibrant uh, economic vitality if you've got just a bigger giant tunnel underneath. 
But if you have some attractive, well-landscaped green spaces in your city, you do have an economic uh, engine. Uh, this is Toronto, the Sherborne Commons. Their previously neglected lakefront um, has become an engine for economic vitality. This is actually stormwater infrastructure. There's UV systems, clean water. It's a whole series of areas and part of this part of um, Toronto. Uh, and it is actually stormwater infrastructure, but it's also civic amenity. And the, uh, this was done before any of the development around it. Um, it came around extremely quickly afterwards. And it's not just an East Coast problem. This is actually stormwater infrastructure and another civic amenity in Scottsdale, Arizona. And of course, the West also has the issues of not enough water, uh, something else that they're dealing with. Resiliency, um, which can be related to water um, as well. There's a common theme through a lot of what I'm talking about. Um, this is after Hurricane Ike in Galveston Bay in 2008. Um, just one hour away from Houston. Uh, this is the plan an SWA group came up with. Uh, not all in place yet, but certainly is taking it in the right direction um, because it's looking at the areas that absolutely have to be protected. It's looking at both hard and soft infrastructure, and that includes increasing the, the vibrancy and the effectiveness of the natural systems that can be storm buffers and mitigate areas that are floodplains. And of course, it's also tackling the hard questions about where we do not build at all, where it's just economically uh, and ethically in a lot of ways um, really inappropriate um, to be building in the future. And these are all issues that I know you all deal with uh, and wrestle with on uh, in many cases on a daily basis. Um, here's another example. This is in Houston. This is the Buffalo Bayou Promenade, uh, another SWA project. Um, this used to be a band, essentially post-industrial, nothing happening, um, no good shoreline. Uh, I don't have a before picture, but it turned it into this, this riverfront. So it works at, as a way to mitigate erosion. Floodplain control. Wonderful area for recreation. There are areas along this that, that are good for civic gatherings. Um, fantastic. But when it floods, which it will, there's not the kind of structures or infrastructure that's going to be damaged or can't be easily or quickly cleaned up. Um, and of course, it mitigates the flooding because it's put back in some robust ecological systems that can help to handle it. Um, here's another shot that um, shows you some of the areas, even taking um, advantage of the areas under the highways, which are some of the most neglected, um, underused, or just not used uh, eyesore areas generally um, in most cities. And this is a very small um, but very important intervention in, um, in the Bronx, Hunts Point Landing in the Bronx. Um, where this is built, um, this little, uh, this is a former dead end street in a highly industrial area. Uh, where this was built, this area of the Bronx and of New York, of the whole New York City, has the highest rate of diabetes because there was essentially one of the highest reasons is there was no green space. There was nothing available for this community. Ultra urban environment, ultra low, uh, uh, ultra low uh, salary levels, uh, very poor area of the city, no connection to, um, to the river. This established it, also provided an area for recreation. Um, we'll get to some human health issues in a little bit. Um, this is another very small scale intervention. This was uh, Greensburg, Kansas, which had to rebuild after an um, F5 tornado in 2007. Um, the community came together. They um, had already been struggling economically. They had problems there. They were a small rural community, about 1,500, but they wanted to, they wanted to rebuild and they wanted to take this opportunity um, to move themselves in a more sustainable and more economically vibrant direction. So they created a plan that would create more density in their small area. Um, they now call themselves also the greenest main street in the U.S. Um, I know a few other communities that try for that label too, but what they've done um, is enormously impressive, and yes, it is helping to make the economy of the city um, come back. 90% of the city, um, by the way, I should point out, was destroyed. Um, and reuse. Um, this is the High Line. I really don't have to say a whole lot about it. Everybody knows what an incredible uh, project it is, um, but it should be and is, in a lot of ways, the poster child for how a green intervention can be an economic engine. Uh, I think everybody is pretty much familiar with that. Um, the Big Dig, whatever you think about the issues they had when they were doing it, 
um, nevertheless resulted in a series of absolutely wonderful urban parks, um, wonderful recreational amenities, places for gathering, places for use. It's driving people there. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be the large money, the large scale interventions. They can be on small scale. Um, this is one, it's less than an acre, uh, just over a half acre, um, in Detroit. Uh, this was a building that had a historic building that couldn't be rebuilt, had to be raised. Uh, some of the private monies around banded together to create this urban community garden and gathering place, turned it away from an eyesore, something that was going to lower property values, to a place that actually brought people in, supported and helped to even, um, even stabilize uh, some of the area around the region. Um, and it also manages stormwater, um, which is a big issue as well. Um, human health, here's where green interventions, again, are critical. Um, we need to put back in opportunities for people to walk. It's about parks, but it's also about complete streets, um, about making sure that there are multimodal um, active transportation opportunities. But parks, the green space, the place to get to it is a critical part of it as well. Everybody knows what's happening in the U.S. with the obesity rates, um, and we know we need to get people moving again, and we know that there's a strong link between how we plan and design and build our communities and, and the public health. Um, and this is a map showing the, the particulate matter, or rather the areas in our country that are out of compliance with particulate matter standards, standards which a lot of health people think are still far too lenient, uh, by the way. And although it doesn't look like a large portion of the country has this issue, when you look at the actually the population that lives in this issue, um, it's a lot. Uh, this is just one of a number of studies that approach how the, what the difference is when you have a landscaped environment that's valuing trees um, for their ability to remove particulate matter and val valuing trees in New York City at over $60 million annually. The uh, city of Syracuse, I think, even at $1.1 million. Um, but it does make a difference uh, to all, our nature. We know that if we have views of nature, we are more productive and more efficient. And what employer um, can't respond to a more efficient and more productive workforce? That happens to be, I have to brag, the ASLA Green Roof. Um, some of my staff doing some yoga up there. Uh, you can come visit us, by the way. We do tours. Being near green space is critical to children's growth, to their health, to how well they do in school. We know that also. Um, but there are challenges to doing this, to getting the green interventions and addressing um, these issues, which are, are the drivers going forward. Um, and it's money. Um, we tend to have a short attention span. We were talking about super storm, super storm. Boy, that's going to say Superstorm Sandy. Um, but for how long do we really continue to focus on that um, and go back to kind of old modes of planning, design, and building, um, old formulas that we didn't like how they came out the first time? Um, Short-term bias. Sometimes these interventions and the investments are going to have a longer-term payoff. They're going to be higher up front. Longer-term payoff, um, but it's often hot, hard, hard, especially when you're talking private development money to make the argument, get the equation to look at the long-term benefit, and our socioeconomic inequities. Um, a lot of the communities that are most in need of the, the attention that will bring that economic vitality back, um, the most in need of those green interventions, to focus on that for a minute, are ones that don't have the money. Uh, and that's where we have a major challenge, because they're every bit as much in need of it um, as our own. So thank you. Thanks very much, Nancy. Now I'd like to introduce uh, our AICP president, Lee Brown. Despite everything you might think, AICP president, I did not come with slides. I am here to react to a number of things that I heard, most of which uh, I have to agree entirely with. Uh, I'm, I'm from Chicago area. Uh, my practice is in, almost entirely from the uh, Chicago metropolitan area. I think that's the only connection to the I have. Um, and, I, and I heard uh, earlier this afternoon someone describe the uh, 238, excuse me, 287 municipalities in the Chicago metropolitan area is resembling something close to the Middle Ages in terms of the way they uh, address uh, 
uh, the political differences. Uh, as a consultant, uh, that just looks like a target rich environment. Uh, I, I want to speak about uh, what we see changes in the uh, in economic development and what I think we have to move towards. And I'll use the Chicago metropolitan area as an example, but I do see it elsewhere in the country. Um, we have, for many years, uh, because of the nature of our funding sources uh, for this number of municipalities driven by uh, sales taxes, have been in rate of use chases, which means that they seek uh, they seek taxpayers that will pay uh, sales taxes, uh, which means zoning property and, and annexing property to get to the shopping mall uh, or to get to property that will become that form of value to them. And in the end, it turned out to uh, drive businesses away from their downtowns. And then economic development was used to rebuild their downtowns. And they used all the investments of their TIF districts that were available uh, to uh, attract uh, uh, businesses that would fill their downtown spaces, killing off the other businesses that had been there that had survived the shopping center on the town. And after they spent all their TIF monies uh, and were not receiving the investment to pay it off the uh, incentives that they gave out, they looked for the next uh, trigger to their economic health. And it turns that they tend to see economic development as the tool right after the downturn. And there is a peak and valley cycle of economic investment to uh, growth management. And on one hand, when things are going great, we're all about saying no that's too much, and when things are going badly, we're looking for any investment. And so in some communities, the fast food restaurant is considered economic development. The other thing is that we are in an incredibly competitive environment, so we're competing with the next community over, and see only the interests of our local community as what will drive our long-term um, health and stability. And so the very few communities that thought long range rather than in the cycle and invested in their long term quality of life rather than simply into the, uh, the greatest number of dollars that were invested in their downtown managed to uh, survive the great depth and rise in their regional economies and are the ones that are now most capable of attracting investors and attracting economic development. They're not the ones that are trying hardest, they're the ones that are thinking longest. And so if we can think more about the 50-year cycle rather than the five-year cycle and invest rather than spend our economic development dollars, if we can change from a competitive neighborhood by neighborhood or uh, community by community against the next to a series of uh, intergovernmental partnerships for economic development that revolve around the scale that works best for attracting the kinds of businesses and investments and jobs in particular that work on a regional level rather than just at the local level, we're much more likely to see the kinds of long-term stability and, and health of our communities. And so we need to build that not just into our plans but also in our development review processes so that instead of swinging from the economic development cycle to the uh, growth management cycle, instead of going first to no and why not, and then to anything is fine, we need to be able to get to yes, but. In the long term, 
the economic development is built into the plan, not simply the reaction when something isn't going the way we thought it should. Now Patrick Phillips, CEO of ULI. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to talk about something quite specific, but I think I'm going to use it to illustrate some of the large themes that you've heard expressed so far. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, as Paul said earlier, Bill and I um, made a living together uh, in the business of, of uh, making, making forecasts, specifically about the relationship between economic growth and demographic change and the demand for various kinds of real estate development. And uh, as uh, you're all aware of the, the old line that it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. And uh, that's often attributed, by the way, to Yogi Berra, who never said it. It was actually uttered by a Swedish or a Danish physicist named Niels Bohr. The story is that he, that he used it to distinguish the difference between Swedish humor and Danish humor. <laughs> you had to be there, I guess. So planning is a profession that's very much engaged in the future, uh, in thinking about the future, to varying degrees on making predictions about the future. And my contention is that this is getting even more difficult all the time. Uh, and, and I think that that has important implications for the profession of planning uh, and for the way we approach land use and development regulation and planning itself. So I'm, I'm talking specifically about our, our ability to translate population and economic growth into projections of demand for, for space. Um, and that's basically how we have been for the last 50 or so years allocating land for various uses, deciding where we want to spend our capital investment dollars to provide infrastructure and service that growth, and how we award entitlements to uh, the developers and other entities that will actually develop the real estate. So either the, the job is getting harder, the job of being a professional planner is getting harder, or the credibility of these institutions and these methodologies is, is threatened, or to some degree, to some degree both. You know, planners uh, are given a great deal of credibility by society and by our elected officials, and and uh, to the extent that those predictions and forecasts and plans are intended to convey certainty, then I think we've got an emerging credibility issue because I do think that it's it's becoming much more difficult to assess the the patterns of growth based on the rules that we've used in the past. So I think we need to, as a profession, em embrace uncertainty to a certain degree, but also develop more flexible and responsive tools. And I think that, that Lee's uh, comments were, were on target there. So let me use a few examples to explain what I'm talking about. You know, For a long time, we've had very predictable ratios. We have a certain amount of population growth. That translates into a certain number of households which translates into housing demand, given traditional patterns of, of uh, how people want to consume housing. That leads us to the units by type and an allocation of density across the landscape. We can do that all pretty rationally, or we have been able to. Domestic uh, product, growth domestic, gross domestic product, GDP growth, leads us to job forecasts, which leads us to square footage allocations or projections for various kinds of workplaces from office to industrial and everything in between. Income tells us what households are going to spend, and that helps us understand the demand for retail square footage. So these sorts of predictable ratios are actually kind of embedded in the, in the traditional planner's methodology and toolkit. And it was certainly a big part of what, what Bill and I and, and many others did for a living, was to try and understand those relationships. Well, today there's very rapid and very dramatic change in those kinds of ratios. Simple example is thinking about office space. You know, for years we, we assumed that each office worker used about 250 square feet 
of space. Now, it took about 20 years for that to edge its way down to maybe two and a quarter, two ten. You know, that was, we, we kind of got used to that. We began to adjust for it, or at least recognize a larger potential range. Well, in the last 10 years or so, that's been driven rapidly down uh, in the most thriving areas of the country with respect to, to employment growth, particularly Silicon Valley. You'll find ratios of about 95 square feet per worker. A huge difference. I mean, if you translate that to, to you know, space and, and land, what used to take a 250,000 square foot building, it's 1,000 jobs or so, now requires less than half that. At typical suburban densities, that drives you from about 12 acres of site required to about four. So big, big differences. And that's before factoring any, in any preference for, for higher density or different configurations. Same kind of thing in retail. You know, most of the last 20 years, we've thought it's about 15 square feet per person, per capita. And of course, we know that there's generally too much retail, right? Retail goes obsolete pretty quickly. Well, that's really happening even faster now. A big factor, of course, is the internet. Online sales are about 6.5% right now, total retail sales. But that factor is growing by about 15% per year. It's making a big difference. Uh, in the amount of supportable retail square footage. We also have stagnant incomes, we have an aging population, you know, there's some other variables at play too. But mobile computing is a big factor. Big chunk of online sales now are coming from online or from handheld devices. Now for industrial, on online retail has been a boom. You, know, you got to store all that stuff and you got to get it out in trucks or wherever else to the, to the, to the consumer. So there's been a big growth in, in industrial square footage around the country. It's now called logistics, by the way. So if you want to be, you know, if you want to be current, it's logistics. Sounds a lot sexier than industrial, doesn't it? So there's far fewer workers per square foot these days. There's super flat floors in these big facilities. There's robotics stacking and retrieval systems. So what we used to think of, about 600 square feet per person, is now well over 1,000. So the same kind of pattern. Hotels, too, are being disrupted. Has anybody heard of Airbnb? Yeah, it's a really disruptive technology. It's in its early days, and it's, 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 it's easy to, to sort of scoff at the idea of renting your couch to a business traveler. But it really is making a difference in some markets. Even parking. You know, DC has just gone through a, a big battle in terms of a rewrite of its zoning regulations on relaxing some of the parking minimums. The fact is, you don't need parking ratios the way you used to. All of this is about, there's two real common threads here. One is technology, right? You saw that coming. The other is a drive for efficiency in both space and land, getting more value, getting more utility out of land. And again, in addition to those factors, there's a preference for mixed use, there's a, a preference for compact development solutions, walkability. We know the market's moving in that direction. But the disconnect is that much of the post-war planning profession has been focused on greenfield development. It's changing, of course, and we've been seeing this now for the past decade or so, but many of the tools, many of the, the ways that the planners are educated focuses on the, on the idea of kind of current planning. And when you're out talking to uh, planning officials and day-to-day -day planners, most of what they're doing are zoning reviews, site plan reviews, and approvals, and the like. Well, in the future, I think much, much more of the, of the planning profession is going to be about repositioning, remaking, redevelopment, it's going to be about responding with existing buildings and existing communities to these new forces and to these new ratios and these new market preferences. So it's an increasingly rapid cycle of obsolescence. And that produces challenges, but it also produces opportunities. It's not just obsolescence of the space, though. It's really obsolescence of many of our traditional planning tools. And the challenge is that it's not just making life difficult for, for market forecasters, but it's that the ill-suited nature of this standard toolkit. So how do we address this? What's in the evolution of this toolkit? I think it's about partly moving from a forecast mentality to a scenario mentality, looking at the, the broad range of influences that affect land use and community building and development, redevelopment, and thinking about alternative scenarios and making choices about the allocation of public resources uh, as well as regulation to achieve a desired outcome. Obviously staying flexible, building in flexibility to our planning tools, moving from regulatory tools that specify a specific outcome 
to those that specify a specific level of performance and allow for creativity to solve for the best outcome. Moving from a traditional adversarial public and private relationship to one based on a mutual self-interest. Building institutions to actually foster a dialogue about the, uh, the community futures that incorporates both public and private. Now there's been many existing critiques, some now are quite old about planning and they make the same case. So is there anything new here? I think the real new thing, at least for me watching the business, is, is about the pace and the magnitude of this change. And uh, really, our, our program of work at ULI is, is perhaps a very clear reflection of what's of concern to what we call broadly the industry, but it's really that constellation of actors that make communities uh, thrive or, or, or change. And it's all about this redevelopment, repositioning, efficiency, taking advantage of technology, looking to this 78 million uh, strong new generation, the millennials, uh, and they're embracing new technology and how they're going to drive change in the future. So uh, I think that uh, the challenge for the planning profession is to, uh, is to keep up, uh, as it is for all of us not in that millennial generation. I'll stop there. Victor. <laughs> So the final comments before we have a conversation, uh, Victor Austin, please, uh, from the district. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the District of Columbia. Um, I'm hoping that you spend plenty of money while you're here, because I do want that retail sales tax. <laughs> <laughs> Let me begin by saying that Patrick made me very nervous. And the reason he made me very nervous is because everything that he said was true. Absolutely. It's, al it's almost dis it's, it's disruptive for planners right now. I mean, we have to think of our existence in a different way. Um, I'm gonna, I'll tell you a, a brief story, and then I will talk about really how we've been planning for prosperity and how we've been executing for prosperity, and I think it gives some context. So two years and nine months ago, um, I received a phone call from, um, from Mayor Gray. Um, he had just been sworn in a day before, and he said, um, Mr. Hoskins, uh, I received, and this was him. This was not somebody from his office, this was actually him, which really freaked me out because I'd never met him before and um, I don't know if you've ever heard him speak, but he has this beautiful, deep voice and he said, uh, Mr. Hoskins, uh, I'd like to talk to you. And I felt like I had done something wrong, so I was a little, a little afraid and I said, I I'd love to talk to you too, sir, and what about? And I thought it was, you know, I mean, I was a consultant at that time, I was looking for business. Um, he said, I, I got your name from someone and I'm looking for someone to serve as Deputy Mayor of Economic Planning and Economic Development. I'd like to talk to you. And I said, I'd love to talk to you about it. So we sat down, and I will tell you this. After five minutes, I knew that this is a person that I could not only work with, but also had a different way of viewing the world. And, and let me tell you what he told me. He said, Victor, he said, um, he said, look, he said, I really want to change the District of Columbia I was born here, I grew up here, I went to undergrad here, I went to graduate school here, I married here, I raised my children here, and I am now an elected official here. I want to change my city. I do not like where it's going right now. And at that time, things were at a standstill in the District of Columbia. Some of you may not remember this, but it was at a complete standstill. The financial markets hadn't quite recovered. Uh, commercial confidence was not quite there. And he started to give me a litany of stalled projects. He said, Victor, city center project, an $800 million project that's been stalled for 11 years. He said, O Street Market, it burned down 40 years ago, Victor. It has been stalled for 40 years. He said, Shops of the Dakotas, it's been sitting there for 28 years. Skyland Shopping Center, 22 years. And I gotta tell you something, I don't think that's a real good pitch for your economic development guy. <laughs> like nothing's working. But I'm the kind of person that viewed that as a challenge. But what I really wanted to know from him, and this came out in the first five minutes, you know, after he told me all of this, I said, so what do you want to do? He said, I want this to be one city. And I had read, his, I had read some of his materials. I'd heard uh, some of his speeches. And I said, I said, Mr. Mayor, I said, please tell me what you mean by one city. He said, this is what I mean. He said, where a child in Ward 1 has the same opportunity as a child in Ward 8. He said, where somebody in Ward 5 is looking for a job has the same shot as finding that opportunity as someone in Ward 3. He said, I view this as an opportunity to make this a city where everyone has equal access to opportunity. And I said, that's interesting. And that's transformational. So with that, we went about our work. And this is what we did. 
we basically did three things that are very planner approach, very economic development approach, and if you want to, you can see them all online. One is we put together a five-year economic development strategy. A five-year economic development strategy. Yes, I said five years. And the reason why he chose five years is that, honestly, after five years, it's very difficult to measure your performance. Everything gets loose, things get vague, markets change. Five years, six years is roughly a market cycle. So you can kind of see your way through that. And there were two goals of this five-year economic development strategy to create 100,000 jobs in the District of Columbia and to generate a billion dollars in new tax revenue. And that was all cast within six broad visions. I'll give you a couple of the visions and then I'll go to the next document that we created. So the, the broad visions were things like become the most business-friendly environment in the United States of America. Okay, to say that for the District of Columbia is a hard thing to say. That is a vision, that is definitely visionary. And it is something that we are working on in earnest. And I'm not going to get into the details of what we've done so far. But, but that kind of vision, to become the destination of choice for international tourists, national tourists, and foreign direct investment. And I'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of the things that we did. But basically, we cast these six broad visions, and within them, we created 52 very specific initiatives. We are already, we are already complete, we've already completed 20 of those 52 initiatives. And you can pretty much see what we're doing because when you walk out of this building, you see so many cranes and so much under construction. So, so this is five-year economic development strategy. It was really our strategy for prosperity. By the way, the unique way it was put together is probably the, 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 the strongest um, part of the strategy. We went to our four business schools. We took the four deans from those business schools, George Washington University, Howard University, Georgetown University, American University, and we said, help us with your brain power, transform our city. We said, help us. And they used their MBAs and our team actually to create this strategy. So that's the five-year economic development strategy. Then we put together a five-year affordable housing strategy. You don't generate jobs and not have housing. Our five-year affordable housing strategy is very similar to our five-year economic development strategy. One, just a couple of big ideas. This is what we want to do, create 10,000 affordable housing units within the next um, seven years. 10,000 affordable housing units in the next seven years. And yes, I did say five-year strategy, and I am saying seven years, but we had to have kind of that broad vision thing, so what we did is we said 10,000 by 2020. That really is our objective. But it is a five-year strategy. At the end of five years, we have to start all over again. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of, the, that, that's kind of the, the, that's the job part, that's the, you know, the, the housing part. But there's a bigger part, and I think everyone touched on this, which is sustainability. So we created a basically a 20-year sustainability plan. This gets at your longer vision. And in that 20-year sustainability plan, we have basically put heavy responsibilities on ourselves. I'll just give you one of the responsibilities. All the buildings that are built by the District of Columbia are LEED certified buildings, or they won't be built. They are LEED certified buildings. We just completed um, about, uh, I guess it was about 11 months ago, the first uh, multifamily LEED Platinum building in the District of Columbia, and we built it in Ward 8. And if anyone knows about the District of Columbia Ward 8, area of highest unemployment, um, area of highest poverty, um, you would have think that would have been built in Ward 1. No, it was built in Ward 8. We're trying to create opportunity all across the city. So, so this sustainability strategy has really become infectious. I mean, at this point, we have the most uh, number of LEED certified buildings in the country, public and private. And we now have LEED Gold certified schools. We just finished a project in Ward 8 called St. Elizabeth's Gateway Pavilion. This is a magnificent structure. When you see it, it will, it's awe-inspiring. And again, in Ward 8, where we're building three innovation campuses, where we are making sure that all these buildings are LEED certified. Because we want to not only capture the water, but we want to minimize the, the, the power usage and we want to maximize the efficiency, the efficiency of these buildings. Our goal is really to transform the city, and it's happening before your eyes. I'm sure you've seen our ride share. And we don't hoard it, we don't keep it in the District of Columbia, we share it. Our ride share is now in Arlington, our ride share, uh, 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 sorry, bike share, sorry, bike share guys, not ride share, bike share. Um, you've seen those red bikes around town? It is now in Rockville, it is now in Bethesda. We, we, we share the things that we need to share with our surrounding jurisdictions because we sink and swim together. 
We do not view them as competitors. We view, view them as augmentation of our market. Someone told me the other day, they said, oh, Victor, you know, um, so, so how are you going to deal with, you know, Virginia competing for your, your, your tech businesses? And I said, well, I'm not competing with Virginia for my tech business. Actually, right now, we're, <laughs> we're actually recruiting businesses from Zhongguan Sun. For those of you in here who are not familiar with it, this is Silicon Valley of, of China. We're recruiting technology businesses from there. We, we are recruiting technology businesses from Berlin and from London. We just launched a global competition where we're going to have eight cities from around, around the world compete with eight cities from the, from the United States and ultimately do a sweet 16 of technology here in the District of Columbia. Because see, we view ourselves as having a platform of the whole world. The thing is, you really do have to, 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 to think global, but you have to act global. You have to think global, but you have to act global. You have to be global. It is not something that, it's not a choice anymore. So with these three things, with this five-year economic development strategy, this five-year affordable housing um, strategy, and then this 20-year uh, sustainability strategy, we really have recrafted our future. Um, I don't know if any of you have um, had the opportunity to explore our neighborhoods, but before you leave, you have to check out 8th Street, you have to check out U Street, you have to check out 14th Street, some of the best eating in the country. When I came into this region in 1994, it was difficult to find a decent restaurant in the District of Columbia. Now it's difficult to get in the restaurants in the District of Columbia. Um, all I can say is that, you know, it, uh, uh, for planners, this is probably the most exciting time because this is the most disruptive time. That means that ideas that used to work don't work anymore. When I was a kid, I grew up in Chicago. I was born on the south side of Chicago, and I grew up uh, quoting Daniel Burnham. Kids in the neighborhoods in Chicago know who Daniel Burnham is. They, 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 they don't make small plans, because that doesn't have magic to stir your blood. That is what you have the chance to do with these constraints that we have right now. We really have limitless possibilities, and I'm just glad I'm part of this community. Thank you. Maybe two questions. One, uh, we've heard a lot of comments about the, the rate of change and uh, transformation and uh, uh, movement uh, toward issues of efficiency and kind of phrases like remaking, all sorts of things of that nature. But to talk about this the global rate of change. Uh, uh, question I have because I go back to one of Bill's first points, which had to do with the sense of place. Uh, and we're all involved in some way or another of uh, place making. Uh, how do you, uh, in the light of all of this, how do you uh, achieve that sort of place? And particularly, what I would say is the authenticity of the place. Uh, given business practices and the like, from Walmart to Gucci, from Starbucks to Ali Park. How do you, how do you sort of manage to do that uh, in light of all the kind of things you've all described? I just finished talking, so I didn't necessarily want to talk again. But, but um, in, in the District of Columbia, we, you know, we've been very fortunate. We have a very gifted director of planning, uh, Heritage. Don't even many of you know her. Um, she's done a fantastic job of really helping us um, create, um, well, create an understanding that really the first 20 feet um, in an environment is the most important um, part of the built environment, and that weaving that into the community. Um, and having substantial community engagement um, is absolutely essential. So the way that we do it in the District of Columbia, we have something very unique, unique that many of you do not have. We have these things called advisory neighborhood councils. They are actually elected officials, local officials, that they affect every project that we do, and they have some really um, high demands for the quality of design and the quality of, um, of development in their community. So that, that interaction um, is, is, is complicated and it's difficult, but between um, um, our director of planning and her team and these neighborhood councils, we really do, uh, we're able to craft these places um, that really do transform our, our neighborhoods. Well, I'd like to the, uh, I think a lot of us grew up in an era, especially in the West, of uh, growth management. And the planned communities of the 1970s, 80s, 90s. And they were predicated on this notion of build out. And when I was planning director of San Diego, I remember going to one of the communities, North University City, and somebody in the community mentioned that, asked Bill about, and are we built out? And you know, it occurred to me, well, 
know, Manhattan was built out in 1900, I guess. And uh, Rome, many centuries earlier, it's cities that are vibrant really never build out. And I think we have to rethink that notion, that planning concept of build out. Certainly, many folks in the public do, cons do value that concept still. And I think that's where we get some tension sometimes. Yes. I will just pick up on something that Victor said, that the community involvement aspect is absolutely critical. Um, some of the projects I showed and ones that you all know, where the community has come together and what is and what is built, what has been developed, is really responsive to their needs, their culture, their traditions. Um, you get a local culture and vernacular that's different and that really keeps that, that sense of place. And, the, and often the... Um, God is in the details with that. The, sm the small interventions in, in the details um, of the site furnishings, of you know, the, the various, those little little aspects can have an enormous amount to do with, with maintaining that community character. But the community involvement, what they need, what they want, how they really are operating, that's great. The community engagement frequently reveals resistance to change. Yeah. Uh, with everything we've talked about here, which is all about change, kind of what, what the, how do you how do you get beyond that? Effort? You know, I, I, you're right, and it's it, it, community sort of rootedness uh, is an important fundamental ingredient of a sense of place. But I think that there's some some timeless principles uh, associated with what makes a place um, comfortable and welcoming and pleasant to be in, and I think that those are. You know, in my experience, they're pretty well understood by the planning and design professions these days. That, so it's, it's you know, and those allow for some change. Those allow you to continuously improve a place and address them uh, uh, while you're still maintaining a connection to the, the, the culture and, the, and, the, um, and, and the, the local condition. And it's a balance. You know, the, the ANCs uh, in the district come in for a lot of heat. Um, <laughs> because the, the law actually requires uh, the district to, to give great weight. That's the phrase used in the law. And, and, and sometimes it's a little too great because there is this, this embedded resistance to change. I happen to live in a neighborhood um, that, that, that's really out there in terms of its resistance to change. But, but you know, you've got to accommodate it. And I think that, that um, success breeds on itself. And if you can, if you can demonstrate um, incremental improvements that, that people like and enjoy, that, that you know, the, the credibility of those trying to implement change uh, increases. Uh, to a certain extent, it's always embedded in that it's a political process. Managing city growth and development is highly political. You know that? Yeah. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a number of communities that really are looking forward to progress without change. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, impractical for them to try to become something they are not. Uh, trying to drive their greater qualities and enhancing them has been more successful than trying to import a place from somewhere else. What about the issue of, of kind of jobs, jobs, jobs? Uh, John Ram in San Francisco uh, tells uh, the stories of uh, Silicon Valley interest in coming into San Francisco. Uh, because that's where the young creative talent want to live. They don't want to be out in the suburbs. So they're running transit systems from San Francisco neighborhoods where the jobs are while they fight the battles of trying to get the jobs down into the city. Uh, and so uh, uh, the concept of, uh, of being the most business-friendly city uh, reminds me of uh, Scott Walker and his desire to make Wisconsin the most business-friendly state. Uh, sounds like a little bit of a dangerous objective. You know, I guess I guess on some levels it is, um, but to, to get to your point, so in the last in the last two years and nine months, we've um, worked with the private sector, created about twenty eight thousand jobs, um, joint venture projects that are involving the city on city's real estate. It's about four billion under construction. We've cut ribbons on about seven hundred and eighty two million. Um, we currently have about another three billion in our pipeline going forward in the next twelve months, and about eighteen billion forward out to um, uh, uh, five years. So um, so we are not resistant to jobs. We are looking forward to the jobs. And what we have what we have figured out is that the communities want the jobs. It's just that you have to make sure that there's a match. You have to listen to them and yeah they resist change and, and, and 
definitely there is some chip resistance to change, particularly when you're talking about tearing down structures or, or renovating structures. But the bottom line is that you know if you work with them, you can get to a, 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 an end that everyone appreciates, and that's really what we try to do: get to a common end. Yeah, you know, I think I think part of it too is, is your metrics. It you know, used to be the old Chamber of Commerce metrics was monitoring how much how many jobs they generated. And I, I know uh, Sandag, San Diego Association of Governments, and their economic prosperity uh, element, it's focused more on growth and real income per capita. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be an increase, if it's an increase in the number of jobs that are low wage jobs, for which we can't provide affordable housing, then are we really better off? And so it's how do you measure economic uh, progress? And I think, too, nowadays, with the knowledge-based economy being a much larger component of our economic base, the employers are looking to where their talent wants to work and live. And that, as mentioned, they, they vote with their feet and or frequent flyer models. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, uh, Microsoft expanded not in Redmond, but into Bellevue, with more urban development, so they could offer an urban environment for transit uh, than uh, the traditional suburban campus model. Roger? You know, I, I think there's a much more mature approach to this really throughout the country now. Uh, you know, that there's, with the exception, I guess, of, of the governor of Texas recently came up and made a pitch to Maryland firms. That, but, but that's the exception anymore. I think I, I really think that states and particularly local governments are, are thinking about quality of life as a driver of employment growth. And they're paying attention to their universities and to their hospitals, you know, the major institutions that give them strength as a region. Uh, and I, I, you know, everybody has to have a business-friendly uh, tax structure and, and, and regulatory approach, and that, that's, that's clearly out there. But, but um, you know, the, the mayors that I've worked with in the past decade or so are really clued into the fact that quality of life and sense of place are major drivers of economic development. We've got time for maybe two questions. There's a roving mic. Mr. Stamen from Baltimore. Um, what do you folks see in the role of um, professional sports? Um, I think, think the uh, arts and culture is clearly positive. Uh, my sense is that the role of professional sports teams and who should pay for them and so forth was a little more controversial. I was wondering what uh, uh, the panel thinks of that. Well, Pat, in terms of the that. Well, <laughs> well we we're, we're currently, you know, considering a, a soccer team, working with a soccer team here, so I, I currently, we are moving forward on it. So if you're asking me what I think of sports team, yeah, we ought to have one. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd like to have the Ravens. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty amazing, but 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 all kidding aside, um, it is a it is a huge investment, um, and it has to be done thoughtfully. Um, and, and at different times in a city's economy, it is something they should definitely do. Um, a city like Los Angeles, for example, I cannot believe it does not have a, a major football team in Los Angeles, and um, they now have two pretty incredible basketball teams and a great hockey team. So they're they're headed there, but. But you have, I think you have to have it to round out your, your culture. I mean, ours is museums and sports zone. So. Los Angeles has had some money to improve their schools, for example. Right. You know, I, I would add that, that again, I, I think the conversation has gotten better on this topic over the last 10 years or so. You know, we went through a massive yeah. sports, build, sports um, you know, subsidy period where, where tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars were thrown at, at sports teams' owners to build new facilities. And you know, there was an economic rationale that the owners made for that. Um, but I think it was, there was a little bit of hoodwinking that was going on uh, with, with the public. And I, now I think the public is reasonably well informed that, you know, yeah, it sometimes does make sense to invest in these, invest public resources in these facilities. Um, but we need to be real, uh, realistic about what the benefits are. And the, the benefits are largely around you know, quality of life and civic pride and, and, and the like. It, it, they're not major economic development drivers. Uh, they might enhance the reputation of a city at the margins uh, by virtue of some publicity, but you know I, I think they're they're increasingly seen as as what they are, which is uh, uh, is something that people enjoy and that they that they're they're willing to to support. 
I think the, the kinds of economic development arguments that we used to see around sports facilities have largely faded, but it's very clear that Nationals Park down in uh, southeast D.C. Uh, has had a huge impact in terms of, of the ability of infrastructure investment to support new development in a, in a supply-constrained part of the city. That's a rational argument for that kind of major civic investment. And, and I think that's where the debate is focusing now, rather than on jobs or, or income. Yeah, and I think it varies by the context, because you know, we've had very good success with Petco Park uh, in East Village, the Padres mm -hmm. baseball uh, stadium. But it was designed in a way to really anchor a whole district revitalization. Uh, if you just looked at the sport itself, and the economics of that may not may not make sense. And if you look at it from a regional level, you know, economists might argue it's a transfer of an activity. But if you're looking at trying to anchor a district, there it had that benefit. There are other examples, of course, all around the country, but it varies by sport. We, our, our firm also worked on the uh, uh, Olympics master plan for London, and we're currently working on Rio. And there, in that process, it's, it's not about the Olympic event. I mean, that's a big component of planning, but it's eventually the, the reuse of the facilities that you're planning, so it has even more so a legacy use and function for those host cities over the long term. DC has actually done fairly well in this regard. Yes. Uh, uh, my own view is you work like heck to get the arena downtown. It's yeah. multi-purpose. It uh, has events most of the year. You try to cozy your ballpark up against the downtown. I don't favor putting more waterfronts. So it's a waste of waterfront. <laughs> but at least you do that. Uh, football, you wish the suburb well. <laughs> I'll just emphasize that too. Context is everything. And just a few blocks from here is the Verizon Center. And ASLA's building is a couple blocks away from that, and it was uh, not dirt cheap, but it was a darn good deal before that center was developed. And, the, and, uh, <laughs> and we're sitting on a nice increase right now, and, and you can't get a, a reservation at most of the restaurants around there. I think Chicago has learned its lesson now, having spent enormous amounts of money on both the, the cell field for the White Sox and the, uh, and the stadium for the Bears, and its incentive to the Chicago Cubs was to say yes, but no money. Yeah. So I guess we'll uh, we'll end tonight's conversation we uh, planning for the future with uh, uh, comments uh, about the uh, uh, economic investments. One question. Yeah, one question. Yes. Yes. Oh, mention, sorry. What will you need a microphone? This will be the last one. <laughs> Mitchell Silver, I uh, thank you all for your comments uh, and truly enjoyed it. I have a question that I agree with Bill that planning has a long history in economic development, dates back well over a century. I think the 1980s we've seen the rise of economic development and economic developers. Uh, economic development and planning really equal one another. But it seems like we move from plan making to deal making. And want to find out that they're not, I, they're not mutually exclusive. But how do we go forward, since this presentation is really planning for prosperity, uh, that we make sure those two work hand in hand? I've seen very good plans that if the deal comes along, you chuck the plan because it's to create jobs. But how do we make those two work together so that not the economic developers aren't just the deal makers and getting things done, and planners are perceived as the dreamers who just dream and don't get things done? A, um, a good plan can facilitate the deal making and guide the deal making and also set the parameters for when to say no. Um, but if a plan is silent, doesn't provide enough guidance, then it's um, then you're right, it just results on a case by case transaction uh, and you can sometimes win and sometimes you'll you'll lose. That's why we're enamored in, in terms of implementing uh, the general plan city villages strategy in San Diego of looking at uh, performance-based zoning because the big debate we're having with the public isn't whether the urban is what scale of urban is the, the right scale. And so if we have 90% of the people who say along the corridor agree that a four or five story building mixed use with retail on the first floor is fine, they don't, but the big debate is should we be larger and like a Vancouver and have taller buildings. 
Well, we can say, well, let's make that base by right close to it, and then some kind of performance zoning above that with policy parameters on what's required to get back to the public the value capture of that increased value to the, uh, the property owner and developer. But that guidance is already there for everyone to see. The developer, the investors, the city staff who are negotiating, the elected officials, and the public who will hold the elected officials and the planners and the developers uh, uh, accountable. So when you don't have that kind of uh, connection between the plan, then the deals, just as you described, become uh, uh, case by case. The, the, the deals are always going to happen, but I think the, uh, the more mature communities are evaluating the return on investment. We're beginning to say, this is how much it's going to cost, what am I going to get back for it? They're looking beyond simply the return of cash and, and tax dollars into the return of the quality of life in their community. <laughs> And it's key to keep your eye on the placement. Because if you keep that component in there, the deal making isn't going to send you in the wrong direction, or at least, well, less of the time, send you in the wrong direction. In this very hall a few years ago, the economic development director of Pittsburgh, when I worked there as a planner in the 1980s, early 90s, came up and we were talking and said, You know, Paul, uh, we did some things together in Pittsburgh. We had some uh, conflicts. Uh, it wasn't until years later. This uh, economic development director speaking said, "I realized that uh, the, the uh, role of the economic development director was to make the deal. Uh, the role of the planner was to make sure the deal was done right." <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it.